So, moving on to the next talk, we have a guest from France. He was born in Paris, uh, ran his own company, finance company in Geneva. Later on, moved to, to London, where he became uh, president of the Libertarian International, uh, and also uh, working with other libertarian nonprofits like the International Society for Individual Liberty, doing exactly or the, the kinds of stuff we're doing here in Bulgaria, maybe on a better and bigger scale. Uh, uh, he's going to talk to us about why we should not obey the laws of our country. Please, yeah, I actually agree with him. Uh, uh, please help me welcome Christian Michel. Thank you so much. You've um, given out the uh, plot uh, because the uh, title of my talk was Should We Obey the Laws of Our Country? But you've already given the answer. I'm, so, I'm, so, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> but, but I, first of all, I want to tell you how pleased I am to be uh, here. And uh, it's my fourth trip to Sofia. And uh, when I came here the first time, it was between 1990 and 1993. And uh, yesterday I went around for a short walk in, um, in the downtown Sofia, and it has changed. I mean, you don't realize it because you are so young, but in the last <coughs> over 20 years, the place has changed, and it is an inspiration because it shows what can happen when you give people a little bit of freedom, a little bit of initiative, and suddenly the place changes. That's what happens. Now, okay, back to the question. Uh, because it is a question, that's how I started it. Should we obey the laws of our country? And actually, if you had asked me this question some time ago, I probably would have told you, well, if you want to obey the laws of your country, if you believe that they elevate your spiritual awareness, if you believe that they make you a better human being, if you believe that they lead your country to growth, prosperity, um, then Obey. Submit. I prefer not to, but please be my guest and follow what your leaders tell you. Now, with wisdom and age, I've changed my view. And it is the reason for this change of point of view that I would like to share with you. I find laws stupid, contradictory, humiliating for those they apply to, and very much biased in favor of those in equity. But there isn't a society without rules. Even anarchists will tell you this. Anarchists will tell you what we want is not a society without rules. We want a society without masters, which is different. And in any society, you will find that you can break down the rules that we obey in four categories. First of all, we have morality. Morality is our personal rule book, the way we behave individually. Then you have contracts. Contracts that become rules between you and the person you have contracted with. And then you have rights. Rights as in human rights. And then, finally, you have legislation as promulgated by the various authorities, political authorities of countries. Now, let's examine these four categories, one after the other. And first of all, morality. As human beings, as individuals, we have values. And values are simply the things that we want to acquire when we don't have them, and we want to retain when we do have them. Values are things like life, health, love, beauty, social recognition, family, work, money, a dog, if you have one, a Ferrari, if you have one. These are values. And they are fungible. There isn't a world there with like moral values and another world with material values. Because you can trade one for the other. I mean, people give up love or family because they want to pursue a career. People will tell you, maybe a boyfriend will tell you, look, it's 
you or my dog? And you say, I choose the dog. Fine, you know what sort of person he is or she is. And values are the things that are taught and bequested to us by tradition, by philosophers, by religion, by wise people. They guide us they are towards the good life, what Aristotle called eudaimonia, the good life. Now, is it subjectivism? Is it relativism? Are all values the same? It's just what you prefer. That's a topic for another occasion. I won't go into that. But I would simply say that if you are right, if you believe you are right in the values that you have chosen, in the hierarchy of values that you have chosen, which is it's a hierarchy, it's what we call morality, then being right doesn't give you rights. It doesn't give you the possibility or the right to impose these values on other people. Because if it were forced on other people, then their values, their morality, will only be limited to a binary situation. Submit or rebel. And that's not much of a moral choice. We want to have more moral choices than that. The purpose of morality is actually how do we get a more authentic life? How do we get a life that is richer, that is deeper in meaning, that is fuller, that is bigger? You know, a life that escapes the littleness of everyday existence and where we see the beauty in all things. So yes, we can achieve this. And this is what philosophers tell us. Philosophers tell us that there are different ways to achieving this. Religion, Christianity will tell you, you want this pilgrimage illuminated by the love of God. Buddhists will tell you, you want to renounce worldly values, worldly values which can bring, us, bring you unhappiness. Um, others will tell you, you have to devote yourself to a great cause. These are different ways to achieve exactly the same purpose. So there is a hierarchy of values. In this quest for authenticity, and simply in everyday life, there are very few projects we can achieve by ourselves. I mean, imagine, for instance, that you would have in your existence to procure by yourself everything that you use, whether the utensils of the kitchen, whether clothes, whether food. Of course you couldn't do it. Therefore, you rely on other people. We are part of a culture. We are part of a society. I mean, every newborn is born expecting a culture, exactly like every fish expects water. So, in this relationship with other people, we enter into contracts. They may be very informal contracts, like the one we have all entered into when we decided to attend here. We didn't sign a form, well, maybe you did. Uh, but we, uh, you know, if we are friends uh, and so on, there is an implicit contract. You know, you invite me, I invite you, um, we, we get together, we do all these things and so on. We don't need to sign on this. But then, they are more, I mean, contracts that are more committing, like, you know, buy and sell and things like this. And they are especially these collective contracts which tie several people together. Small, a family, a club, but big, corporations. Corporations are nothing else than a web of contracts. Contracts between shareholders, between the company or shareholders, and suppliers, and employees, and directors, and financiers. That's what a corporation is. And some corporations, like McDonald and other, have more than a million employees. Churches, in a way. You know, the Catholic Church has still a billion faithful. So these are very big contracts. Do they restrict our freedom? <coughs> Actually, think about it. What is freedom? 
It's not something that is abstract. Like love. I mean, what is love if actually you don't implement it? If you don't love someone? And freedom is the same thing. Freedom is simply the possibility to make commitments. Freedom in abstract has no meaning. Freedom is what you do when you engage in an activity, when you commit yourself, when you make choices. And that is what contracts do. But when you enter into these contracts, you exercise your freedom simply because you have given your consent. And giving one's consent is not doing necessarily what you want. I don't want to work for £20,000 a year. I want to work for £200,000 a year. No, sorry, I want to work for £2 million a year. That's what I want. My problem is that nobody has offered me £2 million a year. And I cannot force that person to pay me £2 million a year. So we are always in a self-certain situation because of our gender, because of our age, because of our culture, because of our skills. So that is what it means, making a choice. Actually, I'll do a test. I'll ask you, choose. Go on, choose. Well, you are thinking, between what? <laughs> and that is what happens when you make choices. There must be a menu. If we were pure angels, if we were sort of ethereal spirits, we would have nothing to choose. We would have no freedom. The reason that we have to choose is because we have a body, because we have needs, because we have desires, because we have these desires informed by our situation, historical situation, culture, and so on. So there is a menu. And sometimes, sometimes, this menu is not very palatable. If you are offered a choice between starving or working for a shoe factory in a very poor country. That's not a very good job. That's not a, a job that is satisfying. But hey, it's better than starving. And if I were offered that job, I mean, I would pray every day for the directors of this company because they saved me from starving. And then I would add a prayer that many other companies come so that I have now a choice between these various companies where I can find better employment elsewhere. And the thing that is important when you have these difficult choices is to find out whether the person who is offering the, your poor salary, your poor working conditions, is responsible for the fact that you are starving. Nike is not responsible for the fact that the country is very poor and that people are starving. I mean, the government of that country has done it well enough itself, creating the starvation conditions in that country. Nike offers a solution. Whereas the chap who tells you your wallet or your life, he creates a condition where you have to either surrender your wallet or lose your life. He is not offering a solution. You see the difference. And this is what is important. Now, the sum total of these contracts, of these interrelations based on consent, is what we call the market. And the market is not the aggregate of for-profit transactions. It is the sum total of all interrelations that are based on consent. So church, charities, trade unions, families, friendships, that's all part of the market. The relations you have with mafias and governments, that is not part of the market, <coughs> simply because you can't say no. Now, a society and an economy that is organized by contracts 
allows for the emergence of a new. It gives you a better chance for a big life, a life transfigured by ambition, by surprise. That's what innovation is. It's always surprising. And by struggle. And a society that is organized around this concept, freedom, is simply the society that has faith in the constructive powers of ordinary men and women. <coughs> people like you, people like me. People who are active in technology, in the arts, in science, in lifestyle, in business. It's a society that makes use of our dormant energies. And that is the society that is transformative, that aspires to make all of us, individually, better people. Actually, because we are in Bulgaria, it reminded me of a story I read a long time ago. Uh, I don't know whether you're familiar with the 13th Tribe, which is a book, an essay, by Arthur Kersley. And Arthur Kersley tells this story. The old Bulgars, not you, you know, Bulgars of the old time, um, had this attitude towards people who were very clever, too intelligent, quick-witted. What they said is that he is too close to God. So they put a rope around his neck, Jerry man and hang them on trees in the middle of the village and let them to rot. Why? Because these people are disruptive. They challenge the authorities. They challenge the lifestyle. They make society different. And the people who have an interest in the society as it is don't like people who are intelligent, creative, who can do something new. Every innovation is disruptive. It threatens established forms of cooperation. It creates resistance. Now, we don't hang the old capitalist to the lampposts of London or Street. But very often they are the ones who resist innovation. They fight innovation. They use government in order to prevent innovation. So what we need is to force capitalists to embrace capitalism. Not enough to. And find well, the other, the third type of rules that I mentioned. Our rights. Because there are billions of people, seven billion probably, with whom we have no contract. We don't have time, we don't have you know, even the desire to enter into contracts with them. We have no project that we want to do with them. They are just the passers-by. The people you meet when you land in an airport and you know, they just go around you. But yet, you want something, a rule, that is already there, that ensures your protection, whether you are in Bulgaria, in Brazil, in Belgium, or in Botswana. And this idea of rights, which always existed, but has been famously formalized, first by the Declaration of Human Rights of 1789. And I would like to you know, just give you a couple of, well, two or three examples of this famous declaration of 1789. Take Article 10. It says, no one shall be disquieted on account of his opinions, including his religious views. So far, so good. That's what we want. We want, right? Not be disquieted because of our opinions. But, the text continues, provided their manifestation, the manifestation of his opinions, does not disturb the public order established by legislation. That's all right. Article 11. Every citizen may, accordingly, 
speak, write, and print with freedom. So far, so good. But shall be responsible for such abuses of its freedom as shall be defined by legislation. Now, Stalin would have signed on this. <laughs> Ayatollah. Article 17. Since property is an inviolable and sacred right. I mean, these are strong words. Inviolable and sacred right. Nobody may be deprived of it. Except when public necessity, legally established, clearly requires it. What are the protections offered by this famous declaration? What are they? And actually, there is an illustration of this. You know that this Declaration of Human Rights was declared, publicized, on the 26th of August, 1789. On the 2nd November of 1789, after having declared that property is a right inviolable and sacred, the same people who, writ, who wrote that declaration confiscated the property of the clergy. The largest taking of private property ever done at the time. It shows how much worth are these sort of declaration of human rights. And of course, the 1948 Declaration of the United Nations is even more preposterous. Um, you know, in the most countries where there is famine, it says that you have a right to social security, free medical treatment, holiday without pay. Um, so all these sort of rights are not going to give you very much of a protection. Yet, you have to have it. <coughs> Yet you have to have, right, as social animals that we are, we have this intuition that we need rights. Libertarians probably have read this, if you have read more than five pages of libertarian literature. You have read about the non-aggression principle. <coughs> no one shall initiate force, physical aggression, against another person and their property. But that is prohibition. That is not a right. The way to formulate this as a right is to say everyone may do what they want with what they own and only with what they own. If there was a constitution that I should write for a new country, which I wouldn't do, but assume. That is the single article I would have in this constitution. And then I would say, well, let judges adjudicate, arbitrate, between people who claim that this is what they own. They paid for it, they received it in inheritance, they are, there is evidence that it is their property and somebody has trespassed or somebody has used it without but there the are objections to this. And you know these objections. And one is, well, actually property rights, property rights. Where do they come from? You know, is it fallen from heaven? Well, of course, philosophers, political philosophers and so on have discussed this, written whole libraries of books about this. And the one argument which is generally received and accepted is John Locke's argument that you become the owner of something because you have mixed your labor with it, which is probably as good as you are going to get because is a person that has not mixed his labor or her labor with something that was previously unowned does that person who has done nothing have a better claim on the good than the person who has actually transformed? And you probably would say, yeah. You know, they, they don't have a better claim. And the second objection is, of course, that if you accept this, that you may act only with what you own, what about the people 
who don't own anything. Well, if you read John Locke, of course you start by being the owner of your body and the owner of your work. And it is because you mix the product, uh, you, you mix the good, with your labor, which belongs to you, that you can say that the good belongs to you. So we all have a property, the most precious we will ever have, which is our body. You can say that, well, I don't own my body, I am my body. Yes, but it's a good way, juridically, to say, I own my body. And then, people who have vast property, they're always on the lookout for skilled, studious, um, loyal people who become trusted agents. And they use the property of others to be themselves well-paid and acquire property. That's how it works. So now we have a truly universal human rights. It's a common good of humanity. That's what this right is. It is a common good of humanity. And if you define freedom as the use of one's property rights, violation of property becomes a violation of freedom. Not just assault and rape against your body, but theft, taxes, takings, limits on your movement. And if you define justice as a Roman did, Romans did, which is render each one their own, sum quique tribuere, then property rights gives you freedom, peace, and justice. What you may do, freedom, how to adjudicate your conflicts peacefully with judges, peace, and justice. So, if we look very rapidly, as these characteristics. We have morality, which is the full, full development of our individual person, which is I language, me. Contracts, collective contracts, which is we language, what we do together, we have signed the contracts. And rights, universal, do not need consent because they are the condition of human beings as social animals. It is it language. It's out there. Ah, my question, should we obey the laws of our country? Well, the question is, what are these laws doing? We already have morality, which guides our behavior towards others, which gives us love, compassion, the duty of assistance towards the weak, towards the poor, towards the disabled. We have collective contracts, that organize social life, the coordination of all our projects around the planet. And we have rights that guarantee our protection, give us freedom, justice, and peace. So why legislation? <coughs> legislation wants to be universal, at least in one country. And rights too. But hey, rights are not interfering with other people's property. Legislation orders you, compels you, forces you to act. Contracts call you to act, but they are based on consent. Legislation is not based on consent. I mean, there is this idea of social contract, you know, Cotswold. When did you sign that social contract? Where is your signature on this social contract? And legislation won good. You know, they always say we are pursuing the good of whatever and so on. But good is what morality gives you. And morality cannot be imposed. As I said earlier, it's only a choice between rebelling or submitting. I mean, when you pay taxes, you are not generous. You are just robbed. So, to confuse legislation with morality, to enforce moral value by law and police, that is what we call fundamentalism. That's what the Ayatollahs do. To confuse legislation with the rules of certain organizations to attain some great objective, you know, the nation, and so on. That's fascism. That's what fascists want. 
And you can fuse all together morality and organizational rules into legislation. That's totalitarianism. totalitarianism. So legislation is not only useless, because we have all these other things, morality rules and so on. It's, it fosters violence. It is the root of all bad regimes. It is what psychopaths want, who want to rule you, who want to force you to obey to what they want. Legislation is designed specifically to violate rights. We have rights that say, do not kill. Legislation said, except when it is an enemy of the state, except when they wear this green uniform, then you must kill. Legislation says, do not cheat. Sorry, rights say, do not cheat, except when it is for the greater good of the country. Legislation said, uh, rights say, sorry, <laughs> do not steal, except when it's for taxes. So you cannot say, as in my naivety, I was saying years ago, obey legislation if it pleases you. I think we have a moral obligation to denounce legislation, to denounce this system, and get around it as much as we can, at least not collaborate with it, not participate in its elaboration, not vote not follow political parties that want to create new legislation. In other words, we are not people, or we shouldn't be people, who say, look, I have a best master. You should obey my master. And the other one there says, no, no, my master is better. We want my master in government. And the only reason you are playing that game is because if you don't get your master in government to impose your laws to all the others, the others will impose your laws to you. And what sort of game is this? I mean, this is what children play at school. Libertarians are masters, all of them, individually, and they don't want slaves. They are not slaves running after masters. So the only rule, I think, if you don't play that game, Get around it. The only rule is don't get caught. Thank you very much. Time for questions now. Do we have Joro? Thank you for the presentation. Any more questions for you? Because we have now, I'm sorry, we have now. Uh, regulated businesses, and if you want to make uh, like an entrepreneur, if you want to, to create a company, and it's a uh, regulated industry like like liquors, and for example, I want to make like uh, private clubs just to avoid regulation. And we go to to post more 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 of these ideas to. Yes, that's right. I mean, you know, in, in an ideal world, we will not have masters at all. Um, probably what you want in a situation where, let's call it slavery, of course, it's technically it's not slavery, um, it is, well, let's find a better master for the time being. But the thing is, you don't want to compromise here. You don't want to stop here. You want to go further. <coughs> The ultimate objective is not to have masters. And I'll, I'll say something very briefly, uh, you know, sort of expanding on your question. We are in regimes today under a dictatorship of no alternatives. What the regimes we are living on are all saying, their ideology is to say, this is it, guys. 
It's not going to get better. Democracy is the ultimate we can achieve. You can tweak around the angles. You know, you can say, well, more social democrat or more democrat social. But it's not going to go anywhere. Now, is this what we want? Is this the best we can achieve? If this, you know, the countries we are in, the situations we are in, is it something that, you know, 4,000 years of history, of battles, of revolutions, of coup, and so on, to achieve what? Sweden? I mean, that is the end of history that is as despairing as you can think. We want something that makes us better. Not just people taking benefits from the state or paying benefits to the state and being regulated to death. We want something when we can move humanity to a higher plane. And these regimes are not delivering this, right? So if they tell you, well, take it as it is, there is nothing better. I mean, you want to go further. You want to say, yes, okay, I'll collaborate now because I don't want to go to jail. But I know there is an objective. I know there is a society that is behind the horizon. And it is beyond the horizon that I want to go. Never lose sight of that objective. <coughs> okay, more questions? Then I go to... Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you very much for the presentation. It has been most interesting. Um, I, would like, uh, uh, I would like to ask you to elaborate a bit on this. Um, you talked about legislation, and uh, we know that legislation mostly comes from uh, certain groups who would like to use the state to have uh, some sort of benefit for themselves. And the reason this happens is because the state owns uh, the monopoly on, uh, well, should we say, uh, peacekeeping or violence, the same thing. So um, uh, many people argue that uh, if we uh, reduce the peacekeeping um, uh, abilities of the state, that uh, the world would plunge in chaos, and uh, then we would start everybody with own maybe 10 guns, and then we would start killing each other randomly. How would you comment on that? Well, you see, the state is a stage in the development of humanity, what we call history, which is probably better than you had before, you know, tyrannies and so on. But it is only a stage, and there is an after state. And I think this is what we want to design, this is what we want to figure out. Not that it will happen exactly as we planned it, because we know that planification doesn't work. But we want to have the imagination that there is a possibility beyond the state. And there will be a crisis. You know, Michael Tanner told you exactly what's going to happen. But imagination is the way to avoid a crisis, because you can imagine what would happen after the crisis. And therefore, you can either reject certain possibilities that will happen after the crisis, or find the things that will lead you to a better life after the crisis, without the crisis. The problem is that if you don't have that imagination, then you have to go through the crisis. You have to go through the old to die brutally in order for the new to emerge. Let's think about the new and make the economy of the suffering of a crisis. And that is what libertarians do. Libertarians say, there is something behind. Let's imagine it. Let's conceive it and see what happens. And let's avoid the suffering of a crisis. But unfortunately, our voice is not heard enough, so maybe we will have to go through the crisis. But at least we will have told people, don't despair. We have some solution. Let's try them. Let's experiment together. Um, there is a feeling today, and again, Michael Tanner said this, there is a feeling of abandonment. People who have made a commitment to the welfare state, 
People who depend on the welfare state. People who have put their trust in the welfare state for their pensions, for the education of their kids, and so on. Realize that the welfare state is deserting them. It's not delivering what it promised to do. And there is this frustration of being let down. And we don't want other people to capitalize on this. But we want to give them hope. We want to say, look, you've been let down. Why don't you do it yourself? Why don't you join me and others? And we'll do the schools. And we'll do the roads. And we'll do the pensions. And we'll do all the things that a civilized society needs and offers people without the state. So if I, if I can build on, on Alexander's question, do you think that uh, we can even do the, the, the night watchman job that the, the, the government does? So can we provide peace as well? Can we have um, contracts that, that don't need to be enforced by the government? Yes. I mean, a good example, people don't talk about it enough, Interpol. If you look at criminality, Criminality is either something that is very local. You know, the chap who runs away with your bicycle. And you don't need the state to do this. You can have little sort of police and so on at the level of the village or the neighborhood. Or it is across borders. And there, states can do nothing. So states said, we have Interpol to do it. Well, let's privatize Interpol do not necessarily have Interpol as a private for-profit company. But it could be a company that becomes independent of states and therefore is not used by states. But then its only objective is to go after criminals and bring them to justice. And when you think of justice as it is administered today, more and more you have jurisdictions that are above and outside the state. You know, the Hague uh, Court, the European Court of Human Rights. All these courts were created by the state, but now they have become independent of the state. And they are examples of what we can do outside the state, because we can privatize or we can make these things even more independent. So what we are seeing is that, you know, the big forces of technology, the big evolution of humanity that we call history, is pushing towards this. Because technology is telling us every day that borders are artificial. Borders don't work. And therefore, you have to think of what happens after state, after borders. I mean, cultures are important. You know, no one is more fanatical about French culture than I am. About, you know, French language. I love walking in the gardens of Versailles. I love Notre Dame. I love Paris. And live in it, but, you know, as a tourist, it's a great place. I think French culture is probably there right at the top. <laughs> but I don't need France. I don't need a government of France. I don't need a passport of France. It's probably convenient to have better than a passport of Bolivia. Yeah. I hope there are no Bolivians. Um, but, you know, um, any other passport. British or Swiss or America, yeah, that would go. That would do. It's just an administrative thing. So yes to culture, but no to states. Okay. <coughs> uh, we had a question over there. Um, thank you for the lecture. Um, I agree with you, and like we say that uh, we are not given a choice when we participate in the state. But what I, what I often hear from others is, okay, but you're perfectly free to move to any other place in the world you want, or here you go, Somalia is the best place for an artist to be. What do you respond to such kind of um, objections to your thesis? Thank you. Well, ask the person who tell you this, why should you be the one to do this? Do they own Bulgaria? Are you from Bulgaria? Yep, yep. Do they own Bulgaria? Can they say, look, leave Bulgaria, as they would say, leave my house? You are as much a Bulgarian as they are. So therefore, it is as much your right to be here as it is theirs. So this argument, if you don't like it, leave it, is the typical
give an argument that people would treat their country as their private property. And therefore want to impose rules that they would impose on their private property, on their private estate, to everybody, as if they owned the place. Thank God they don't. Thank you. Okay, more questions? A question over here. Um, I wanted to ask you, for me it was interesting to hear what you said. Um, my concern is um, who defines what morality is and who defines um, what the rights are. Oh. If we say they are defined, how do we enforce them? <coughs> I, unfortunately, I have a plane to catch in about an hour time. Uh, because that is, you know, the sort of question that I would like to discuss with you for, you know, the whole afternoon. Who defines what morality is? I think, you know, give you a very sort of brief answer. Um, morality is simply the scale of our values. You know, the things that we value. And they define the sort of person we are. And they are the things that make us, when we implement these values, they make us more authentically ourselves. They make us, at the same time, more authentically human beings and part of humanity. Um, but of course, they are, because we are all different, they are different things that exalt who we are. Um, we have different skills, different aspirations, we come from different cultures, all, all these sort of things. So it's difficult to say, well, there is just one straight line and this is what we all should follow. In order to become who we really, really are, are we, we have to go through tours and detours. We have to experiment. <coughs> and this is why it is so important to allow this experimentation in uh, you know, finding your way, finding your lifestyle, finding what makes you the sort of person that you are. Um, so there is no definition of morality. They are guides, philosophies, wise people, your grandmother, uh, you know, people who, who inspire you, poets. And they say, look, how about this? Does that resonate with you? Does that create a vibration where you feel, ah, oh, that's, that's me, that's absolutely me. And then you follow that. That's as good a definition I can give you. It's not scientific. I cannot demonstrate it. But I think it works more or less like this. Okay, more questions? Go on, sir. Thank you, thank you for your knowledge, I appreciate it. I have uh, one very important uh, question. Personal firearms ownership. Huh? In Bulgaria, in uh, uh, paper, I'm allowed to, to have a personal firearm, but in reality, I don't. I'm not. So, if I want to defend myself from evil people, I have to buy my, uh, buy my firearm illegally. So, I have two choices. First, first choice is to be defenseless enemy with no dignity. Second choice is to be a potential prisoner. Is there a third way? Um, no, there is probably no third way, but do you need a gun? <laughs> I mean, I know that, you know, there is this obsession of Americans with, you know, having guns. Um, and I, I don't want a gun. Even if I were living in, you know, in Texas, I wouldn't want a gun. I'm terrified of guns. I don't like them. Ideally, I would like that no one has guns. That's what I want. You know, a world where guns are not necessary. Why would you have them? Now, there may be situations, Somalia, you know, where you need guns because there is a complete breakdown of all the rules. All the rules I've given you, morality, uh, you know, uh, coordination, organization, I mean, everything breaks down. Um, so maybe you want guns, but that's going back to the Stone Age. That's not civilization. So, if you absolutely want to have a gun, do it legally, hide it, don't get caught, don't use it. <laughs> don't
don't use them, except, but you know, there are so few cases, even in Bulgaria, where of you know self-defense. And I personally do not see examples in history where people who had guns resisted the government. Revolutions were not made because peasants had guns. Peasants had forks and sticks, and they fought the government that had guns. And sometimes they won. So if they had had guns, you would have had a long, protracted civil war. You would have had the people who were rebelling, fighting between each other. Look at what happens in what's happening in Syria. You know, they start with sticks, then they get guns, then they fight between themselves, not only against the government, but you know, the Islamists, the jihadists, with the people who are you know, your group. So, it doesn't end. Um, so, I don't know. I mean, you know, it's, it's your choice, it's your reading of history. But the horizon that I'm looking at, that I'm aspiring to, is the sort of society, the humane, the gentle society, where guns are not needed. Okay, more questions? Uh, in the beginning of your speech, you mentioned that you qualify walls with humiliating. Can you prefer to disobey them? So my question is, how do you define your own disobedience? <laughs> um, I'm a coward. <laughs> I'm, I'm afraid of police, uh, jails, and, and things like that. I'm not a revolutionary. So my disobedience is really under the radar. But I try to. You know, I uh, try to. Uh, avoid paying taxes. I won't tell you all the things I do. <laughs> but um, let's say that I, you know, I'm not throwing stones in government buildings. Um, yes, I think that, you know, we, exactly like morality, we have to find our way. We have to find our ways where we are authentically human beings. <laughs> where we say, look, master, uh, every time I can get away with you, I will. So, if you want to flog me, if you want to you know, send me to jail and so on, uh, you do it. But what would be your benefit? So, I don't know. I, again, you know, it's a difficult question. Is, does that answer your question? <laughs> you okay? We have time for two more. Two more. Ah, uh, yeah. Sorry, I didn't see you. Um, I have some kind of conflict with one of your views. Correct me if I misinterpreted what you said. Um, this uh, view of a better civilization, organized something. It's based on a mastermind who has this beautiful imagination. I have some conflict with the core, the core idea. Anyhow, a mastermind. Please, please explain. Well, I'm a bit saddened by what you said. Because if I understood you correctly, what you are saying is, let's be practical. Um, we need to be practical, but we need to dream. And at your age, you know, in this world, don't forget about the dream. Be practical. Go into business. Go into things that will make you, you know, better, I don't know, earn more money if that's what you want to do be more beneficial to society if that is what you want to do. But don't forget the rule. Because when you lose that, what do you say that, that remains in your life? If there is no more space for love, for beauty, 
for imagination. What is that? A bank account? A CV? Maybe children? Maybe a pet? Um, is that enough? I don't know. I, I, I think that would not be enough for me. And I hope it's not enough for you. I hope you still have this idea that there exists in the future a society that you are young enough to be participating in and that you want to leave to your children. Do I, I, am I convincing you? Um, what, what I'm telling you is that there is a future that you are going to build. And if you build it within the framework of what exists, it's not going to happen. It's only going to happen if you imagine something that is beyond what exists. This is what people do actually in business. This is what innovation is about. You know, um, Henry Ford famously said, if I had asked my clients, <coughs> sorry? Self-initiated, it's not a mastermind that has a better imagination than mine. Well, then follow someone who inspires you. I mean, I'm not creating all this. You know, what I'm telling you is what I've learned from my sort of inspiration, from the people, my, my gurus, my guides, my guides, but my guys, you know, the people that I think are tracing the way for me, that I explore, you know, the road. And I'm following, and I want to be, you know, just at the cutting edge. Yeah. So I want to tell my sort of anecdote about Henry Ford, because I think it's very telling. You know, Henry Ford said, look, if I had asked people, if I had asked people um, what they wanted for transportation, they would have said faster horses. You know, that is when you remain thinking in the same frame as before. So you have to think differently. I hate this expression, outside the box. So I'm not going to use it. But think of something like this. You know, think it. <laughs> okay. We had a final question over there, right? Yeah. Yes. Um, well, some of the questions actually were more or less directed uh, towards the mastermind question, uh, how do we really, well, you said that you're opposed to a social contract, to the, like, at least to the con there's a construct that we kind of uh, think of, that uh, who signed that contract, but should it be like a moral uh, collective contract that uh, dictates our rights and our view of how society and the world should look like? And if so, um, we had some other questions that had to do with what you do to achieve this bright future. And um, um, do we need a, li the, a libertarian's guide to the state or to the world or the galaxy? Or like the anarchist cookbook, the libertarian cookbook? Something like this, like guides and uh, steps to follow to achieve the dream or this vision? And how do we do that? Okay, well, the first question, the question is, uh, first is, is easy. Um, there are people who have thought about these things. You know, from Greek and pre-Greek philosophers and you know, Buddhist monks and so on. So, it's a good place to start. You know, you don't want to, and you cannot reinvent. Artists, scientists, you know, all these people, they start from some place. And, as I said earlier, there is somebody, or there is a philosophy, or there is a work of art, or body of works of art, that inspires you. And they move forward. You know, they don't simply copy, they don't replicate, they don't imitate, they create from that basis. And so that's one thing. Start, read it, you know, the anarchist literature and so on, and then you make it your own. You absorb it and you know it becomes it becomes your own. Um, the second thing sorry, I forgot the thing, but the second thing what? The guy to the galaxy. Uh, uh, yeah. the galaxy. Uh preparing guide to the galaxy. Well, yes, but it is, it is you. You know, you are the one who is making, who is tracing the road. So, um, you don't want to, you know, follow the herd. Because then, what is changing? What you want is simply a society that will <coughs> allow you and others to find their own paths. That is a society that we are not allowed to live in. 
But what we want is a society that says, go and experiment. Find your way. If you are gay, if you are this, if you are bad, if you are uh, you know, an artist like this, if you are a scientist like that, go and experiment. Find your way. And then people will follow you. You know, I, had, I remember I had this discussion when I was in Russia with people, you know, the old communists, who were telling me, uh, you know, there was a war between capitalism and communism, and we lost. It was never a war between capitalism and communism. In the most capitalist country, all the people who want to put in common their means of production, who want to share their income, who want to renounce their inheritance, they may do it. So, it's the war was between the people who wanted to impose communism on the people who didn't want communism. And if all the people who lived the communist lifestyle had been so happy, then everybody would have said, that's a good experiment. We want to follow it. And they would have joined the communist party. And the communist party would have grown. They did it. And we would all be communists today. The fact that very few people join unless they have the NKDD or the KGB on their back means that maybe that was not the lifestyle they wanted. So, yes, experiment. Even communism. Why not? If it makes you a better person and the people who want it for themselves is a better person. <coughs> so, social contract only if you're signed. Uh, I think we should finish. Uh... Unfortunately, we have to finish. Let's let's thank Christian Michel for his. Thank you.